is show a few slides from the paper, the presentation that I came here to give at the conference that was at uh, the branch of the university that's at Media City. And the theme of that conference, which was an internet research 13, 13th conference of this group, the theme was technologies. And so, working with some colleagues at my university, where we're grappling with what it means to be using technologies that might be seen as, or could be used in a disruptive way within higher education as, as it's traditionally imagined and practiced. And I thought I'd start with a slide that relates to our talk about theories and learning approaches. So I'm going to, I've left a, a copy of all of the slides. There are about 78. I tend to have a lot of slides even for a 20-minute talk, knowing that you can leave the slides in SlideShare somewhere and people can look at them later. Uh, and I actually, rec I've made a practice of recording, just using my phone, the audio when I give a presentation, because then I can save the audio, save the slides, and in SlideShare you can put the two together. And then, rather than giving the talk again at home, I can just say, my slides and the talk are online and people can, you know, it's part of the flipping the classroom thing. So I'll start in the middle of some slides and show a few and skip through others. Connectivism is a term that arose in the, even after mid 2000s, around 2008, MOOC. We've all heard of MOOCs now because of Coursera and Udacity and edX, the large platforms, corporate platforms dot-com startups that are about the acronym Massive Open Online Course, MOOC. The term was coined in 2008 by um, David Cormier, who together with George Simons and Stephen Downs began teaching open courses in 2008. And they gave them that term, which they weren't completely happy with then and are certainly not happy with now because it's been taken over by the industrial version which they're not completely unhappy with, although you can understand their frustration that something that they have devised for one set of reasons and with one set of philosophies has been used for a different purpose. So connectivism is uh, a word, uh, a theory perhaps, advanced by George Simons around a philosophy and a theory of learning based on technologies that allow us to connect with multiple people across the world. Francis Bell, who's here, uh, has written on connectivism and whether it is a new theory of learning. And I came across her work when I was looking myself for literature related to this term. So I would point you into her, her blog and uh, Chrissy could help you find some of what she's written. And I use this slide partly to talk about how connectivism works in action, how people who are interested in the term and interested in these open courses themselves work in a connected way. Uh, and this example is one of many where people collate, aggregate their own articles that they've found in a kind of newspaper or magazine that they use to share with others. So content curators, people who, or trailblazers, as the word would have been used, uh, I'm thinking of an article in 1945 in Atlantic Monthly, as we may think by Vannevar Bush, a scientist who post-war looked at how we now need to uh, devise ways of dealing with the huge volume of information that scientists now have. And he talked about and imagined a machine that allowed you to compare two different microfiches uh, and create connections between them. And he said that such people who do this would be trailblazers. And uh, that thought became popular, or it was revised again, when the internet started to enact that idea of connecting dispersed bits of information here to here, and the people who did that how we think of that process. I mean, now one would talk about connecting the trailblazers themselves, that it's not just a matter of connecting dispersed bits of information or texts or narratives, but those people who do that now have to do it as a collaborative group because we've gone that level up in terms of the, the amount and complexity of information that we're having to deal with. So connected learning, what does it mean when we're learning in a connected fashion, when we conceive of our activity and even of ourself in a more ecological manner, where it's not about the individual learner, it's about learning and how that might happen within an organized or self-organized network of learners. What it, what's connectivism? 
uh, leads us to the question of what it means to be connected. It's about expertise that's widely distributed in our society and culture, and the fact that anybody can help somebody get better at something. And this could be in formal learning. We're not worried here about whether it's formal or informal. We're simply identifying the possibilities and potentials that using current, not even new, technologies uh, presents to those of us involved in formal education. This is a book that's been widely discussed. It's a good text that talks about uh, what many refer to as peer-based or commons-based production, collaborative production, which is both around knowledge and about information sharing and, and learning, a new modality of organizing production, radically decentered, collaborative, and non-proprietary. This starts to uh, raise issues for institutional structures that are based on location-specific walled gardens, where things happen within a framework that's organized from the top down and utilizes, if you like, older technologies, not just material, but, but social. Stephen Downs said this in a presentation that I heard online, and uh, haven't been able to find the quote again, but I'm sure he'd, he'd agree that he said this, continues to, the product of learning is not knowledge, the product of learning is a transformed learner. If that's the case, then, how do we create the conditions where transformation can happen for individuals? <coughs> and for groups. Ex you know, experience design is what we would call this in, in, in the design discipline. The notion of connectedness, what it means, nothing of me is original. I am the combined effort of everyone I've ever known. I think these ideas raise really interesting questions around identity construction, how we conceive of ourself and how discreet and separate we imagine ourselves to be in relationship to others who were. And then issues of who owns this, who said this, whose name gets attached to this. Just-in-time learning, resources, when and where you need them, we're all aware of these. Fast and Slow Thinking is the title of the book. Drive-by Assignments comes out of DS-106, one of these very actively original and creative open courses where they've discovered that you measure the usefulness and success of an assignment based on whether people come from nowhere, discover it, find it such a great assignment, they do it, leave the results, and then you never hear from them again. I heard this, uh, Alan Levine, uh, in Vancouver just a few days ago at another conference where he talked about rep a repository for the most successful assignments. The MOOC MOOC, this is a massive open online course about massive open online courses. I loved it because it was well designed visually, and I teach graphic visual communication, and, and most of the work we see is, is horrible in terms of interface design, typography, layout, and so on. And I love this because of the images. And they use Canvas as the LMS, and I, it's the first time I'd seen that used, and that was interesting too. One of the things that I uh, was doing, and uh, Chrissy as well, one of the activities early in the week was to collaborate on the creation of a 1,000, exactly, word essay. And in our case, it was, what is uh, a MOOC? And I was put in a group with others, and we had, I think, a 24-hour period to do this. And it's a strange feeling when you're typing a, on a sentence and three other people are editing that same sentence at the same time. And you're each borrowing the cursor and it's moving. And then in the end you say, yeah, that's a better, it's getting better, it's getting better. And you forget who made that edit. You know you did something in there and you couldn't have done it with the others not present. And there's a strange sense of an extension of your own Thinking. process. And it, it, it's, an, it's unnerving because it, you get a sense that you're, you're in multiple sentences and places at the same time doing this. I'm meeting these people who I saw also in Vancouver. Um, they're from uh, Coventry. And they have some open online courses around photography uh, that are really interesting. And again, as we're all doing, you're, you're searching for people who like mine, birds of a feather. Uh, that's one of such course. And I put these on just so that people who hear these talks realize it's there and the links are there for the PDF file. Now this conference was focused on technologies, that was the theme, and I was looking at, in our own work uh, at Otago, myself and others, ideas around, well, what constitutes a technology? And what's the relationship between the technologies that we use and the work that we do with them? And I came across Brian Arthur's work, W. Brian Arthur. Interesting because he talks about technologies both as social and material. So 
you know, the phone is a technology and it's, it's easy because we can see it and turn around our hand, we understand how it works and how much it costs and all that. And so we have these material technologies, but we also have technologies that are socially, these are tools that we construct to deal with the increasingly complex, chaotic world that we're in. Those tools include phones, they might also include a schedule, a classroom, right, a committee, the Senate, right, the way that we organize our institutional structures. He also talks about how it's more useful to talk about technologies not as discrete artifacts or entities, but as coherent bodies of technologies. So this is when it gets interesting, I think, because we can think of higher education, the institution itself, as comprising many different technologies that are working more or less in harmony, that are both material technologies and social te constructions. And the internet would be one other body of technologies that has written, you know, risen in recent years. And what we're seeing now is that dance that occurs in that room when you come into that same space, you've got one body of technology sizing up another. You say, okay, you say, it's, it's the internet over there. What's it, what's it do? What's it like? You know, should I become friends with this? Is it competition? Do I draw my weapon? What do I do? And he talks about how something happens, a process takes place when one body of technology comes in contact with a different body of technology. An encounter. Right? Or engagement. Engaging technologies. Now engagement can be the precursor to marriage, or it can be what happens on the battlefield, depending on our attitudes and, and what we think of. We can over time become friends, piece by piece, bit by bit, or we could harden our position and believe that this is dangerous, not just disruptive, and we don't want any part of it. And I think universities are at the moment at that stage when it comes to their response to open courses, uh, and open, full stop. Because open uh, and free can be disruptive when you've got a model predicated on closed and for a fee. So, uh, but it's an opportunity. The other person who I've come across who I think is really interesting and, and useful in this regard is Wanda Orlikowski, who comes out of critical management studies. And in this article that I cite here, she provides a review of the dominant paradigms underpinning what technology is and outlines them. The first is ignore it, pretend it's not there, just look at what people are doing. If you're a management person looking at management structures and organizational structures, the absent technology. The second is that it's external to ourself and has an effect on what we do, but it's something separate from us, and we can leave it or take it. The third is the one that's more current, perhaps, that technologies emerge and are socially constructed, and there's this interplay between us. We change, they change, McLuhan and others might fit into this. She posits a different view that's more about what she terms entanglements in practice a commitment to a rational, or relational rather, ontology that undercuts the dualism that separates the technologies from us, the actors who use them. I won't go through this, but she brings in uh, contemporary uh, physics, Neil Bohr, clouds of possibility, how things aren't actually separate entities existing at any place in time, but there's a, it's, it's the probability that something might be somewhere at a given time, you know, how we're learning about what happens at the very small level. In her view, the technological, uh, the technological artifact should be treated symmetrically as humans, i.e. we don't privilege the human actors, but the technologies themselves and the relations between But Again, it's in socio-materiality, it's all about the relationship between things, a more ecological approach to how they might be related. This feeds into, I won't go into the detail here, how it's about the circulation and almost like the lifeblood in the body that artifacts and resources are and the need to keep them moving and understand how they might be used rather than putting something out there as a resource in a repository like a message in a bottle thrown overboard. There's also this discussion about what then our objective might be if it's not focused on the artifacts themselves as discrete entities but more on the relations between or the relationships between the technologies, the artifacts, ourselves, all of this creating an experience that might lead to transformational growth 
and what that requires. Uh, a situation that privileges and makes possible and encourages conversational, contextual, curated, and connected experiences. And as a strategy, Creative Commons licenses is one way to keep things oiled and moving, artifacts moving ahead. I won't show you all of this, but uh, we then moved into the question of what happens when the engagement between the internet as a body of technologies and higher education as an existing <coughs> older body of technologies, when that engagement takes place. How we often see technologies, including and especially the social technologies, the committee structures, the aquarium that the fish are in, is difficult to see by us as well as by the fish. It's invisible, it's glass, but it has a great deal to do with what happens within that cube or rectangle of water that the fish are in. The same for us, the institutional structures in which we work have a great deal to do with what we respond to and how things operate. And it's a very complex set of boxes within boxes. Technology becomes visible when it breaks, when it fails. And as some say, uh, failure is the crack that lets the light in. It's not what you turn away from, it's what you focus on. Because that's an opportunity for something new, better, and, and perhaps improved. Arthur C. Clarke's famous quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What's even more magical is our ability to make these technologies invisible. Again, until they fail. It's my own Kindle. The screen failed on both of the two Kindles that I had at the time in exactly the same way. And that, for me, highlighted the fact that these things can fail. They fail in this way. And the failure is actually a more interesting thing to look at than, than the non-failure. This quote comes from someone at, at um, a conference in Vancouver on open education from Creative Commons, who said that the opposite of open is not closed. The opposite of open is broken. So if we take this view, our current practices, largely in higher education, are broken practices because they're not open and therefore not working as efficiently and effectively as they might if they were more open and more connected. I then went into a brief story I won't flesh out here on looking for a clip to discuss Ken Robinson's work and book around finding your passion and so on. And I was looking for that clip from Billy Elliot, I don't know how many of you have seen that film, where he goes for the audition to be a dancer, and uh, after his audition, one of the judges pulls him back and says, Billy, tell me, what does it feel like when you're dancing? And he says, it feels like electricity. Right. And I was looking for that quote, and I thought I'd found it here. This is at my own university. It was blocked. I couldn't get to that video clip, because apparently that video is in a repository that might contain other material that, for whatever reasons, is adult, or other, other adult materials led this to be blocked. We have a new policy that came in a year ago because our university is very concerned about the potential problems that come with being open, including letting lecturers look at just anything on the internet. They might be looking at pornography or playing video games and they should be marking essays or Facebook or gambling. And so the purpose, of course, of the policy is risk mitigation and for the university as an institution to be seen to be covering themselves by not allowing staff and students to do things they shouldn't be doing. And that, uh, I found the clip. Uh, I went to the Octagon in the city, which has an open Wi-Fi connection, and I was able to find it there. It wasn't blocked. Uh, and I just talked here quickly about the responsibility that we have as academics and it's in the legislation, the Education Act in New Zealand, they accept a role as critic and conscience of society. And, you know, we do have privileged positions, those of us especially who have some secure position, either tenure track or uh, we don't have tenure in the way that they have in North America and New Zealand, but it's confirmation is what you get, which means you're in a position where your contract is ongoing and it does take some effort to get rid of you. They would have to restructure in most cases to do it. This comes out of one of the MOOCs, uh, the Change 11 MOOC, where Tony Bates, who works out of Vancouver, had studied 12 universities and their use of information communication technologies to investigate the degree to which they were successfully used and whether they were getting benefit from them. He found, broadly speaking, that they added to the cost, but not significantly to the benefits for staff and students. This is his view, judging from that. 
I like this slide. I've, I've used this a few times um, after I found it. It's got a Creative Commons license, so I'm allowed to. But if we take an old body of technologies and we add a bit of the new technologies to it, it doesn't often work out well. You can take your horse and you can strap some wheels onto the back of it, but it's not going to get you a faster horse. It's a horse that's weighed down with something it doesn't need and can't use. And it's a more expensive horse because now you've had to pay for the wheels. But this is what we're essentially doing with most of the institutional practices in higher education. A good example would be clickers in the classroom. I don't know if I have those here. But where in the classroom setting you have clickers where students are allowed to do a multiple choice thing live. Mm -hmm. Where the lecturer says, the war of 1812 took place in, pick one of three options and one of them is 1812. And then immediately they can say, okay, two-thirds of you got this wrong. We've got a bit of a problem here. We're going to do a review session on, on uh, the War of 1812. Right? But you're using that technology that enables you to do something far more uh, extensive than you are. You're limiting its use because you're not discarding the old technology. You're just adding a new capability onto an older technology. So we accept the optimal or the, the status quo because it's not optimal, but because it's familiar and it's work to change things. I use it because I'm a designer. The Dyson vacuum cleaner, you might have seen in airports, the blade dryer. Mm -hmm. Air moving at 140 miles an hour with no heat will dry your hands inside of 10 seconds with less electricity. Right? So it's an innovation that after having used that dryer, I look at the blow dryer based on the hair dryer thing. It's got the fan, it's got heat. It takes 20 seconds, and even then, they're not dry. It's loud, and it takes more electricity. So the, the blow dryer is immediately seen as... I'm not sure how to bring this up now. Look. Look, it's gone to sleep. We get that every week, don't we? <coughs> it's telling us we're finished. <laughs>